Ramona Shelburne of the Worldwide Leader, NBA insider and senior writer for ESPN and ESPN.com uh, back here on the Rich Eisen Show. How was it, Ramona? I mean, it was it was cool. <laughs> like My favorite, I mean, I just love the fact that all these NBA luminaries turned out, right? So, like, how often are you going to see Kareem Abdul-Jabbar sitting with Bill Russell or Allen Iverson on the court with his camera phone recording everything, right? Like, Shaq DJing the party beforehand and Jeannie Buss, the owner of the Lakers, like, dancing in the front row, like, waving her hands like she just don't care. I mean, it's not often you get a scene like this, right? <laughs> so, like, from that that just purely from the spectacle side, from the basketball appreciation side, from the, you know, if you just love sports, like, I mean, who, you, you, you couldn't help but be tickled by it like a night by that, by yeah, a night like that. You know, I mean, do you think as he was going through his career, uh, if I had asked you, told you, look, you know, obviously he was an all time great. We saw it early yeah. on in his career that when his, that, that, that when it was all over, all of those luminaries would show up for him. Would you? Would no, you, right. I mean, honestly, like I don't think Kobe was beloved in his time. Like he may be somebody who's remembered more fondly by history than he was in his time. I mean, the guy was very polarizing when he played. Right? He he only won one MVP. Everybody always criticized him for taking too many shots or being selfish or whatever you want to say. And obviously, you have the rape case in Colorado. I mean, there was there was a, there was a lot of reasons why there people did not like Kobe when he played. And yet, at the end of it. I think it was, you know, in a lot of ways, he owned a lot of that. I mean, he owned it. He, he he apologized to the woman in Colorado. Like, I mean, you go back now to the history of what we're going through. I mean, that, you know, you see you see certain apologies. Uh, Kobe's apology was was pretty pretty strong, right? Now, it doesn't forgive anything that happens. Obviously, somebody felt strong enough to, to file charges. But, um, you know, you look at that and then, you know, his the way he played, you know, he, he never apologized for taking that many shots. He's like, no, I... I really think I'm the best option. Like, this was my mentality. And I think the fact that he just kind of owned who he was, whether you love him or hate him, like, I think that helps in terms of how history is going to perceive you. And he, you know, like, like a lot of a lot of his, you know, historical figures, you know, the, the, the warts kind of get lost to history, right? And you remember the competitor and you remember the great moments. And, you know, they showed some of those last night at the game when they were replaying everything. It was pretty great you know like when he's all the game winners and all the crazy Kobe things that he used to do like you know I had I was here for most of them not not maybe early Kobe that was still where he and I are about the same age I was kind of in high school and college for the early years but but for those later years man like it's, it's 20 years of the same guy in one town doing pretty incredible things so it was it was a great night yeah I mean and I, I just remember you know when I was uh on Sports Center and doing Sports Center commercials yeah. with Stewart and him, right, Ramona? I mean, yeah. this yeah. back then, the reason why I'm bringing it up is that was the kid who waved Carl Malone off the blocks in Madison yeah. Square Garden <laughs> during the yeah. All Star game. And everybody was kind of like, who is this, you know, yeah. this high school kid that thinks he's so great that he waves the mailman off the blocks during an all-star game because he wanted to isolate, right? And yeah. and and now there's Bill Russell sitting next to Kareem, and they're all showing up for him. Yeah. I, it really blew me away just seeing all those visuals last night. Yeah, and you know, Kobe, night. in a lot of ways, he's great at his own mythology, right? He has a storyteller's mind. He has a he, – he understood – that like you know we we there's a there's a whole talk about okay why did he change his number and why did he pick 24 right and there's a lot of legend you know theories on that and you know the the popular one is oh it's one more than Michael Jordan's number okay um, yes he needed a clean break he needed a that was that was, number eight was never his number right when he came into the league he had always worn 32 but obviously that wasn't an option with the Lakers that's Magic's number um, so he had to like he had to choose. Um, a new number, and he chose 24. And like, yeah, we had him on. You know, we talked to him yesterday, and he said, um, "No, it's not the same with Mike. It's it's that there's 24 hours in the day, and I wanted it to remind me that I should always be pursuing greatness 24 hours in the day." And you know, like, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not either. But the fact that he just came up with that, and like, that's the way he says it now, and because because he really he did back it up. I mean, we don't have. Any evidence to the contrary? I mean, all you ever saw were workout videos of him at five in the morning running sand dunes, and 
you know, doing crazy Kobe things, like learning. He taught himself to play piano, and he would post these videos at 3 in the morning of him learning how to play Moonlight Sonata. And later on, he told me he learned to play it for Vanessa because he wanted to prove to her how much he loved her, and that was kind of his way of getting her back after everything that happened, right? And, I mean, it's just like you have these sort of mythological stories that, like, now I just kind of smile because I know the guy, and I'm like, man, that's so Kobe. Right? That's so Kobe. And and I think the younger generation, when you talk to guys now, they, they really appreciated him. They really appreciated that competitive fire. And it was that ability to sort of let it rip and not not care if anybody said, you're too selfish, you took too many shots. Like He's like, well, I think I'm the best option mm. <laughs> at all times. Well, in terms of that, ask the poll question of uh, Ramona Shelburne of ESPN. Brockman, go for it. Yeah, Ramona, who's the best high school to NBA player of all time? Kobe, oh. Kobe LeBron, and we added Kevin Garnett and Moses Malone for good measure. I mean, part of me says it's got to be Moses because he's the original, right? Like, he's the guy that made that okay. And then Kevin, I think, had a lot on his shoulders because that was, like, the sort of modern-day version of it. Um, and there was a lot for him to prove, but... Gosh, I mean, I, I, I'm going to probably, I'm going to probably say LeBron just because he had so much on his shoulders right from the jump no, and please. he has lived up to them. I'm just going to say I LeBron because it's, it's, that's the first thing that pops into my head. Like, I don't think of, I don't really think of Kobe as a high school the NBA player because he, you know, his rookie year, you know, he didn't even score in his first game, right? Can you imagine if LeBron would have not scored in his first game? Kobe <laughs> didn't even start for a year and a half. Well, you know, like uh, yeah, I mean, uh, look, yeah. uh, uh, I, I don't remember, again, being on uh, SportsCenter. I mean, Kobe got drafted in the year that I arrived at ESPN. Yep. Yep. Uh, I do not re- recall um, uh, getting ready to watch SportsCenter and seeing Lower Merion basketball games on the air. Right. I don't remember seeing that, right. you know. And and then, right. and then when, uh, when Kobe uh, was a uh, free agent, I mean, I, I remember or was about to be and was thinking about going somewhere else. That was the only thing close to the decision that we've ever seen. Yep, right. That's right. Um, now, uh, I do want to ask you, uh, Ramona Shelburne here in the DirecTV 4K NBA report uh, here on the Rich Eisen show. Uh, we've or- we can already determine so far that the Lakers are on the right track. Correct. They're that they're that their arc is is Ooh. is pointing up. Would you not agree with that? Yeah, I, I think you look like they, they look like they're on the right track, but I I don't know that I would say that like they're there yet. They've they've no. shown flashes of it. Okay, like I think Brandon Ingram has taken a pretty big step forward this year, and he's a guy that kind of you know he's the number two over number two overall pick in the draft two years ago. It's not like he didn't have a lot of pressure on him, but he he's he's got a quiet personality and kind of a quiet game. So he had a he had a quiet rookie season. He, it wasn't bad. He wasn't good. Um, and so people sort of forgot about him, but I, I think he's he's taken a pretty big step forward this year. I think Lonzo, if you look at the last week of Lonzo's games, he's he's starting to look like he's figuring some things out. Like he's getting to the free throw line a little more. He's being more aggressive. He's actually making some more of his shots. Um, they, so they look good in that sense. And clearly they've you know redone the front office in a way that you could say that that's heading in the right direction compared to what you had before. Um, but I, they still need to land uh, the guy. Like, I mean, I've seen so many Laker games this year where, like, this young team is pretty darn good, but they don't have the guy at the end who can close it out. And, like, the difference both times they played the Warriors is that the Warriors have Kevin Durant or Steph Curry. Like, the first game it was Steph Curry, and he killed him in the fourth quarter in overtime, and the, 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 last night it was Kevin Durant. Like, when you don't have that guy that your team revolves around or that who can deliver in the fourth quarter, you, you don't have anything yet. So who's the guy that wants to come? I mean, let's. I mean, I I mean think, we, we all know we all know that LeBron. Everybody in this town thinks he's he's going to have no choice but to do this because he's, yeah. you know, because it's the Lakers. I mean, it's I, I interesting don't, with LeBron. I mean, I you know I, we we touched on that last week because they played in Cleveland, right? So that obviously was a good moment to to talk about it. And you know, I think the Lakers still have a lot to prove to him because like, yeah, they're going in the right direction, but are they like? Is that current group, they're not one player away, right? Like, they need the guy, but if you're going to, like, LeBron James at this stage in his career, he needs a team that's ready to beat the Warriors. Like, he needs, whether that's in Cleveland or L.A. or Houston or Philly, like, he, you can't just have a young team and hope that he can lead them again. Like, I, and I think that the sense is, you know, if Paul George would also come or if there's another veteran who, who would also be, you know, in that mix, then, then you've got something. Um, but I think the guy that you still look at is Paul George. I mean, that's the that's 
you know, Oklahoma City is they're they're kind of starting to trend in, in positive directions. But but Paul's an LA native, and you still, you know, he didn't ask to be in Oklahoma City. I know he sort of embraced the challenge of being there this year, but he's made no promises, and and you don't have any reason to believe otherwise that he he's still looking at LA. Um, and we'll have fun writing those stories in about a week because they come through L.A. <laughs> <laughs> Ramona, thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Appreciate the two you cents. It, you got it. That's uh, Ramona Shelburne of ESPN. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.